We can do better than SQL, or Squeal, as some people like to call it. But really, uh, the original name is SQL. Uh, you can go look into that. Maybe we can put up a little bit about how SQL went from SQL uh, to SQL. But let's dive into this article, kind of arguing that SQL might be a little bit overrated. Of course, there is some bias here from the author as they are proposing their own solution, obviously. We're probably going to skip over that part. Uh, this was back in 2019, but I've seen this come up a lot, especially uh, with like the SQL versus Pandas kind of discussion. Some people feel like SQL is not the optimal solution for analyzing data. So I wanted to read through this. One, you're going to learn a lot about some of the gotchas, and also you'll just learn some interesting facts. And I can share some articles at the end that this author references from some older sources of people who've been thinking about relational databases and SQL for much longer than we have. So can we do better than SQL? The question we often hear are, why create a new query language? Before we begin, let's uh, overview some of the history of how the relational model came to be and how SQL was created. So let's get it. So some background, I think most of us just use SQL. We don't have too much in terms of background. So a relational model was introduced by Edgar F. Codd uh, in a seminal 1970s paper, a relational model uh, of data for larger shared data banks. There, Codd postulated that all data in a database can be represented in terms of sets of tuples called relations. Codd also invented a form of first order predicate logic to describe the database queries tuple relational calculus. I think, I'm assuming this is, I remember doing something similar looking at, um, I don't know what it was called, like, relational algebra or something. So it was something similar when I uh, took my database course. I remember we had to like write this weird borderline nonsensical logic uh, to try to represent queries instead of writing the queries. Personally, it wasn't very practical, but maybe we'll put up a few examples here. But I, I'm curious if that's kind of what they're referencing here. All right. Cod's ideas were revolutionary for the first time. Uh, a database and a universal way to query it was described in a succinct, consistent mathematical model. This naturally created lots of interest in further research and, importantly, into practical implementations of relational models. In 1974, Donald Chamberlain and Raymond Boyce published a paper uh, which introduced a set of simple operators on tabular structures of equivalent power to the first-order predicate calculus. Chamberlain and Boyce felt the formal relational query language uh, proposed at the time were too hard to understand for users without formal training in mathematics or computer programming, and the thought that the predominant use of the language would be ad hoc queries, which, I mean, is kind of accurate, right? I think this is one of the arguments and issues that some people have is that SQL is too business-like, right? Like, it's almost like we should be using tools that are more complex because we're trying to do complex things, and, you know, the fact that we're using SQL, which is supposed to be a little more business-friendly, is silly because we're trying to make it usable to everyone, which I think is the goal, though. I do think that part of the goal is people should try to be able to access data. On the flip side, it's interesting that I remember it was, I want to say it was like CEO of DBT uh, said something like it was either around self-service analytics or the fact that we've now made, we've taken things from Excel, like saying like, oh, self-service analytics kind of means Excel to it means SQL now for some people, not everyone, but for a lot of companies, it often means SQL, which was oddly enough, a raising of the bar, right? From Excel to now SQL, we, we've arguably made it more complex, not less uh, for people to access data if we just use that versus Excel. But as data gets bigger, you kind of need better tools and Excel has just too many limitations after a certain point. So let's kind of continue here. Initially, the authors did not consider SQL to be a serious language. Nonetheless, the great interest in the commercial application of relational models had pushed IBM to quickly adopt the product SQL, which was also picked up and quickly used by the competitor Oracle. So I just wrote a whole article about how most of our standards, and, and this is actually where I picked it up from today, uh, and the ones that we're picking up today as well, were all created by businesses, right? It makes me think of that scene from Silicon Valley where I want to say Richard created the search algorithm or something for the songs, and he had created it for like a B2C, you know, a B2C kind of use case. And the argument that suddenly the CEO saw is like, well, oh my gosh, these engineers never can see the big picture. This is way better for a B2B kind of case. So as soon as people see something for a business application, someone clever figured out how to market it and make it standard. And suddenly we're all using it without thinking about it because there's good marketing behind it. I wasn't alive obviously back then, so I don't know what it was like, but yeah, good marketing can push things. So, but again, there's of course bias in this article to probably push a little more of the influence and vendors have done this because they're a vendor who would like you to purchase their solution. So IBM had an overwhelmingly large influence over the tech market at the time. So SQL became the de facto standard for relational databases and then a proper standard with the publication of the first ANSI standard in 1989 that essentially circumscribed the most prominent existing implementations of SQL. Subsequent versions of the standard continued to be primarily influenced by the commercial vendors. Again, 
he's also, or the, the author's also a vendor, so just take that with a grain of salt. But we're about to start the critique, which I think is the fun part. So today, SQL is by far the most widely used database language. That's probably true. I don't have data, but based on what I've seen. But that does not necessarily mean it represents the best of what we can do. Uh, have you seen how to write MongoDB queries? Uh, it's... <laughs> Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to write analytics queries in that either. In fact, SQL's beginnings as a simple ad hoc language coupled with design by implementation from the competing vendors had left the language with a baggage of severe issues. Feels awkward how that's written with a baggage of severe issues. SQL, especially its earlier version, so starting to critique, was heavily criticized by the experts, including Cod himself, uh, as well as CJ Date, who published a multitude of papers and books on the subject. Uh, I looked at the critique paper. I want to say it was from Cod. It's it's hard to read only because it, if you go look it up below, the text choice that they used was um, unfortunate. But I'm sure you can find one that's in a better format. While many of the early shortcomings were fixed in the later versions of uh, the standard, some of the serious issues had only been further engraved. Some of the complaints here apply to SQL as a whole, while others are specific to certain implementations. We're primarily using uh, Postgres for this example. So, and, and a lot of these shortcomings are actually also referenced in, I want to say it's Cod's paper of SQL shortcoming, but he's expanding upon it, or at least ex from his perspective. So, lack of proper uh, orthogonality, uh, SQL is hard to compose. Lack of compactness, SQL is a large language. Lack of consistency, SQL is inconsistent in syntax and semantics. Uh, and poor system cohesion, SQL does not integrate well enough with application language uh, and products. So let's dig into these these various complaints. There'll, there'll actually be some examples of SQL uh, after we get through more of the philosophical standpoint of this. So right here, he's talking more philosophically, and then below, I think he'll talk a little more about actual uh, tangible examples. So orthogonality in a programming language means that a relatively small set of primitive co constructs can be combined in a relatively small number of ways a language with good orthogonality uh, is smaller, more consistent, and is easier to learn due to there being few exceptions from the overall set of rules. Conversely, bad orthogonality leads to a large language with many exceptions and caveats. Not a large language model, though. A good indicator of orthogonality is the ability to substitute an arbitrary part of an expression with a variable or a function call without any effect on the final result. In SQL, such generic substitutions is not possible since there are two mutually incompatible kinds of expressions. A table expression is a SQL expression that yields a, a table, right? Select star all from table. A scalar expression that returns essentially one value, singular scalar value. I haven't seen these in a while, these terms, but that's because I think I've stopped trying to accidentally get those errors that, oh, you know, you're trying to get a scalar response when you need a table or vice versa. So a table expression can be used in a from clause in a function or with an operator that specifically expects a table expression as an input. What's worse, the scalar and the table expressions may have exactly the same syntax, which can be a source of further confusion. For example, let's imagine we need a list of names of all department heads in the company. This query would do it. So select name where it's department head. Now let's say we need to add this bit to a larger query that extracts information about the department. Uh, an intuitive way is to simply add the above subquery to the target list larger query. Let's look at that query. This is legal, but only if it returns not more than one row. So what they're doing here um, is essentially trying to bring back a new column where they're getting this department head for this specific uh, department. Otherwise, you'd have an error. I I've definitely had this error. Like I've, I've tried to return this when it tries to return too many things. I, I think in general, I try to avoid putting a query like this where you query inside the actual from clause, essentially. So right underneath the select. So before the from clause, but in the select because of this issue, because you have no idea what, what's going to return. I, I think this is one of those things you just learn not to do. It's not like terrible, I guess. I, I wouldn't say this is a good reason not to use SQL. Otherwise, the error would be raised at runtime. To count for multiple department heads, we would have to rewrite the query using a join. But that's how I probably would have written it anyways. Because the other way, like the other reason, that the and now I'm thinking like, oh, why is this bad? You're going to run a query every, I think it's going to be every time you get back that row. I'm trying to think how that would actually compile versus just running one subquery or one CTE and then joining it. So the join would be the correct way anyways. Um, you, you probably shouldn't do the other way. Uh, the difference in structure is large enough to make any sort of source level query uh, reuse impractical. Again, UCTs, I guess, or subqueries, which I'm not gonna get an argument about that, but I think that's a bad argument. At least maybe orthogonality, because I think that's a reference also from uh, the original critique paper, but I don't know if this is a good example because that's not how you should use SQL anyways, from my perspective. Lack of compactness. So if you claim that SQL is an elegant language characterized by orthogonality, some call it 
uh, an elephant on clay feet. With each addition, its body grows and it becomes less stable. SQL standardization is largely the domain of database vendors, not academic researchers, without commercial interests or users with user interests. I mean, that's funny. I guess maybe this is an argument for like open source, but I mean, these days, even academic researchers become, you know, closed source products. See Databricks, right? Although it's open source, right? Like they want you to use their paid version. So I don't know what they're saying here. Like, shouldn't it be, does it matter if it's vendors or academics or who creates it? I'm sure please comment below, but uh, it's kind of an interesting argument. So SQL is not a small language. The time of writing the Postgres SQL implementation contains 469 keywords. Just part two out of 14 uh, of the SQL 2016 standard it has 1,732 pages. The main reason is that SQL, in line with its original goals, strives to be an English-like language catered to non-professionals. That quote, like non-professionals, I hope that's not uh, arrogance. Uh, however, with the growth of the language, the, this verbosity has contributed negatively to the ability to write uh, and comprehend SQL queries. We learned this lesson with COBOL, and the world has long since moved on to newer and more succinct programming languages. It's like, this is not, not going to be the same thing. Uh, at least maybe with AI, maybe somehow you can like massively replace SQL very quickly, but it's too ingrained. Like <laughs> you're making a, an argument that's, it's, it's just not going to work, right? It's the whole, is it Lindy effect or Lindy hop effect, right? It's not going to get rid of it. In addition, uh, keyword proliferation, the orthogonality issues discussed uh, above make queries more verbose and harder to read. All right. So we're going to start going to some queries. So lack of consistency. This one, I think we've all experienced if we've worked in with different languages. So SQL is arbitrarily inconsistent, both in its syntax and semantics. What makes things even worse is that different databases have their own version of SQL, often incompatible with other SQL variants. Here are a few examples of entirely different calling conventions in SQL. So we've got a substring, um, both for Postgres and trying to uh, also trim and extract different things. I think the funny point here is like, I, I don't know if you would liken different SQL databases as different programming languages or different versions of programming languages. So like Python 2 versus Python 3 or Java versus Python. But in both cases, there are differences. I, I guess that's what's funny. It's like, yes, they're, they will not be the same. It is funny how different they can be sometimes, but I guess nothing like, again, programming languages aren't the same. Program, programming languages between versions aren't the same. Like, I, I don't know what the argument here is, right? Maybe it's lack of consistency, but there's always a lack of consistency between different tooling. So... Not sure if that's a good argument personally, but I also get frustrated by this, so I get it. So we're going to skip down to nulls after this. I really do think nulls was a lot of good points here. If you haven't run into these issues, you're going to run into these issues with nulls, so I, I really do like them. So uh, nulls, a bag of surprises, and I think this one's good. In some cases of inadequate handling of missing information, the problem is incorrectly perceived to be a problem of the relational model. In fact, the problem stems from the inadequacies of SQL and its non-conformance to the relational model. So that's from COD. It has been extensively argued that null is the biggest misfeature of SQL. I think if you run into this, you know it. It's a pain. Uh, in fact, the handling of null in contemporary SQL implementations is so surprising and consistent and dangerous that this topic deserves a separate section. Null is so special that it's not equal to anything, including itself. And this is one of those things where like null is not blank. Null has no real clear value. So that's one of the reasons I think why null is sometimes considered not equal to itself because it you can't know what it means. In fact, almost any operator or operation on null will return null and the effect may be very subtle. So in the first example, we compared null against null and we didn't get anything back. Or we got uh, null back essentially instead of getting true or false. And then here in this example where they create a table and they give you kind of one, two, and then a null, you get this blank, obviously. So this is insert. And then when you say select uh, all from this table where A is not uh, in either one or in null, you actually end up getting nothing back. So this is actually doing it on uh, the first side and you actually end up getting nothing back, even though there is null. So you would think that it would at least return uh, two, but there's something weird with that null. But in some cases, null is equal to itself, uh, such as distinct. So here's an example where there's two nulls that should, if you run a distinct, right, return. If it's not equal to itself, should return in theory two rows on top of the one, but we only have two rows return, uh, one null and one row and one in the next row. Which again, going back to the example of where null equals null, they did not equal each other. So they, this is, I think, a, can be a validly confusing section. A similar thing can be said about the union uh, below where we've got these nulls. And because we're unioning, you know, one, two, uh, null, and null, you would think that in theory, if nulls didn't equal each other, you would get both uh, rows returning, but you didn't. So it's just some difference in, in, in what you're expecting. 
Much more traditional logic and Boolean algebra rules cannot be safely applied to SQL Boolean expressions in the presence of null. For example, the law excluded P or not. P uh, does not evaluate true if P is null. So here's a good another example. So I'll select count from X where A equals one or A does not equal one. So again, this is using that first table where we have one, two, and null. And then kind of, I think the, the best example is this case statement where they really start calling it out um, because there's just such a difference uh, in terms of like, you have the same logic twice with this case statement, but just for essentially the, the inverse, right? So select case when uh, A equals one, then one, else not one. So this makes sense in this first one, right? Like you'd expect one and then not one, not one, because you're not getting one. But you expect that twice, right? If, if you were to then inverse it and say not one right here, you're saying the inverse logic. Uh, then it should be not one, else one. But for some reason, now the inverse does not work the same, right? For some reason in this in this new query case when A does not equal one, uh, then not one, else one. It's another reason to not use negatives when you can avoid it, right? Like negatives get confusing, but also because it gives you an unexpected output. In theory, your data should be better so you don't deal with this problem. The row containing B equals three is classified. Neither is one or not one, even though the construction of the case expression appears equivalent in both cases. Row containing nulls, uh, null can sometimes get counted and sometimes don't. I like this example too, because we kind of have this count again. Again, we're still just using that core table. Select count from A. So when you're doing the, the specific column, null doesn't get counted. But when you do the rows, you get the count. I think that kind of can make sense though, because you're counting more the rows than you are counting the specific column. So I think that one makes a little more sense. It's a little less fair. Rows can, containing null can't be compared. So null and null doesn't equal. It doesn't say true or false. And even is null doesn't work. So here they have, you know, basically select null. If it's null, just get one false because you get one row back, even though you've got uh, multiple values and same with the following. It doesn't, it doesn't give it back. So I'm going to kind of go through the rest. I mean, you can go through the rest of these nulls. It's, it's a lot more examples of nulls and it, it's going to happen forever. So let's finish off this article. And I'd love to hear your thoughts below. How do you feel about SQL? But okay, so we have highlighted the shortcomings of SQL. Why does this matter? It's all about ergonomics. Diagonality, compactness, and consistency are the essential or are all essential traits of programming languages that is even to learn the use effectively on every level of expertise, team size, and project complexity. We become accustomed to the con constant improvement and reimagination of programming languages, Swift, Rust, Kotlin, Go, just to name a few, uh, are great examples in the advancement of engineer, ergonomics, and productivity, but SQL, often hidden behind the layers of ORMs and frameworks, is still very much the dominant language. Well, learn something other than ORMs. No, I'm kidding. Uh, the NoSQL movement was born in part of the frustration with the uh, perceived stagnation and inadequacies of SQL database. Unfortunately, in the pursuit of ditching SQL, the NoSQL approaches also abandoned the relational model and the good parts of uh, relational database uh, management systems. I mean, I do like that last line. I think it's good. I think there's a lot that kind of got lost there. But um, yeah, I'd love to know your thoughts. How do you feel about SQL? I hope this was helpful in learning more about SQL, kind of what's good, what's bad. Um, and what to expect. Well, I think SQL is here to stay, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. So thanks for watching this video and I'll see you all in the next one. Thanks all. Bye.